thanks for tuning in to RougeRadio.com, show 28 of 2012, brought to you this week by Ketter.com, a new solution to your fence ideas. This week on CFL News, Jen talks with Matt Skinetti, Grey Cup writer for CFL.ca, to recap the 100th Grey Cup and all the award winners. This week on Canadian University Football News. Kevin talks with play-by-play voice of Canada West football on Shaw and the producer and host of Crown Canadian University Countdown, Jim Mullen, to recap the Vanier Cup and all the award winners. In Canadian Junior Football League news, Josh and John recap the national championship game and the league award winners. Show 28 kicks off, hot, hot! you. Yeah, you with that sandpaper and paintbrush getting ready to sand and paint that wooden fence again this year when you could be sitting back, relaxing on your patio and watching your neighbors do that work. Get rid of that wood fence and easily install a new low maintenance resin fence that lasts. Visit Keter.com. K-E-T-E-R dot com for videos, product information, and more. You can find this fence at some Costco's across North America and always at Costco.ca with shipping right to your door. Ketter.com. RudeRadio.com. Jen, wrapping up Grey Cup 100 with uh, Matt Schnetti from CFL.ca who was there covering it along with me. Hi, Matt. Jen good to be out of that little environment but at the same time uh it's it, you know it's, it'll be hard to forget that that was a really that was a pretty special evening it was i mean the game was great the whole week was i mean it was a a week celebrating canadian football oh yeah there, there's, there's no doubt about it i mean it was it was just a week for people across the country i know the tagline was an invitation to the nation but it was it was ta- it was a week for people across the country to come together and appreciate something in that I don't think I think sometimes we take for granted. And overall, I think the uh, the experience was great. I think people had a fantastic time, and I really think, uh, or I should I should kind of I should clarify that I hope that those who were introduced to the CFL, uh, and not all of them because that is a little too optimistic, but some of them have a greater appreciation for it uh, after not just the game last night, but the entire week. I think it was a good. It was a great week. It was a great, great invita- great introduction for a lot of people. Um, there were so many activities. The Grey Cup was, seemed to be everywhere. I mean, you couldn't not find it. You know, you really had to go out of your way if you were trying to avoid Grey Cup stuff um, in, right in the downtown core. Anyway, it didn't go much up past City Hall um, or past. I guess Young Dundas Square was the uh, fan zone, and then Front Street was um, completely blocked off. So a lot of Trentonians found out about the celebration the hard way. Quite a few people being turned back by the, at the barricades, confused, despite the sign that had been up for at least two weeks that I knew of. It started off a week ago, kind of, but really the big event started with um, the Gibson Finest Player Awards. Were there any surprises for you with any of the award winners? Because I called them all, so I don't know if there were any surprises well, for you. Well, I'm, you know, I, it was a running theme this week that I... I, I don't. I, the best way I can put it is I, I I went with a gut feeling and I kind of embraced the Stampeders this week because I just had uh, again a naive and maybe foolish feeling that they that this was their week. So my it wasn't a surprise that Chad Owens won, but for all those who want a, a little insight on the voting process, I did get a vote on the uh, on the player awards and I did vote for John Cornish. And the only reason I voted for John Cornish is to see the kind of year that he had towards the end of the year when the bulk of Calgary's production happened right after the first week of August. He did not have 100-yard games every week, but he was a dominant force in a division that is very, very tough. The West, I think sometimes, we I know we don't want to make this league regional, but the West has for many years been a very, very, very – um, strong league. Uh, it's it's been, you know, we, when you think of the defense, you, when you think of some of the the performances that Cornish had, yes, he he did run riot over the Hamilton Tiger Cats and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but overall he was pretty cons- he was pretty pretty consistent when the Stampeders needed him most. And I think 
and this is not this. I, I don't take anything away from what Chad Owens did. He moved his position as a receiver, sh- shifting inside throughout the year, and had a tremendous amount of production. Was the league's best receiver, despite constant opinions from myself included that maybe he was taking on too much. But I just felt that that little spark that Owens brings, particularly on special teams, and perhaps um, his propensity to you know, leave the ball on the carpet sometimes. I mean, there were a lot of – Chad Owens, even by his own admission, had a, had a few too many fumbles. And even it was, an, it was a question that Scott Milanovic had to deal with all the time. I really think in the end I was just uh, swooned maybe too much by, by what Cornish and his offensive line were able to do. But having said that, Chad Owens was a worthy winner. And if you go down the list – uh, I, I really think that J.C. Sherrod. I mean, there was no there was no doubt that J.C. Sherrod was going to win the uh, was going to win the most the most outstanding uh, was was going to win the most outstanding uh, or most outstanding defender. And then if you are going down the list again, John Cornish, obviously most outstanding Canadian. Uh, I I and really. You know, if, if if Chris Williams didn't win, and I thought maybe with the way that Rene Paredes had played, uh, perhaps you know maybe there could have been a uh, maybe a late surge for him, maybe to, to to kind of get a get a few votes that way. But there's no doubt that what Chris Williams was able to do in the in the first thir- uh, third and into the first half of the season, how dynamic he was on returns. There was absolutely no doubt that he deserved that award because he was every time he touched the ball on special teams, there was a potential for it to go back for a touchdown. Chris Williams was also coming off; he won Rookie of the Year. If you just think about the natural progression, I guess next year he's going to win Most Outstanding Player. But you know, I, I think that's um, that's maybe looking too much into it. I, I don't think I think there are a few, and Owens. I think when you take a when you take a look at the top two really dynamic player or top three dynamic players in this league, I think you have to go Andrew Harris three uh, at number three, Chris Williams at number two, and, and Chad Owens number one. I mean, those guys when you whenever the ball gets in their hands, something special happens. And I think just given that Cornish was able to break. Normie Kwong's rushing record and how successful he was in the first half of the season. I really think that kind of sealed it for him. But if you go over an overall body of work and the fact that Andrew Harris really did um, have a tremendous season, I mean, he broke the Canadian uh, record for yards yards from scrimmage, which is which was a ter- which was a tremendous thing. And in the first half of the year, was actually on pace for a thousand yards receiving, a thousand yards rushing. I think if he had done that, um, that would have been really fantastic. I, I would have completely overshadowed whatever Cornish did, I think, and maybe put him into uh, – maybe maybe kind of earned him some conversation from, for MLP. But um, I, I still think, though, that he, that Harris uh, is, is a bit more dynamic player from more dynamic player than Cornish. But just like um, his teammate Adam Big Hill, there were just guys this year that just had a little bit more. And uh, that was Cornish as, as the top Canadian and, and Sherrod as the, as the best defender. Can't forget the, the top linemen. It's the only category that we had the same two people as last year, a reversal of the vote with Olafoy winning and uh, Josh Bork uh, coming in second this time. So they just kind of took their position last year and swapped it. So we have the most of 10 linemen, which I think is an important award because it's one of those positions that without them, nobody else can really do their job. If you asked me to go back to your previous question about perhaps a a surprise, I was surprised at Javon Ofoyoy, uh, not to diminish what he's what he's done, because in order to in order for Travis uh, Travis Lule to be as successful as he is, his his pocket has to move. And although some pieces of that uh, Lions offensive line have garnered some criticism um, and a lot of injuries throughout the year, when you think of guys like Ben Archibald, uh, uh, Angus Reed. Javon Olifioy, I mean, you, you're talking about three important pillars of that offensive line that allow Travis Lule to do what he does. But going back to John Cornish, I don't think John Cornish does what he does this year without Dimitri Simpas, without Edwin Harrison, without John Gott. And those guys, I think, really, even though didn't have their best game when it really mattered, but throughout the regular season, I really think that either one of those three guys could have been, particularly Simpas, I think, because Simpas was my vote. I really think those guys could have um, could have been, coming out of the West, the nominees for best uh, offensive lineman. But I don't think it's, you know, I, uh, some people dismiss this, and it's funny, I had this conversation with, with our good friend Rob Murphy many, many months ago, just about how important that award is because, you know, he was talking to me about what it takes, what 
being an offensive lineman takes out of your body, what it, what just hitting another man, um, another big man who is running at you, what that does to your bones, what it does to your muscles. And when you, when you think about the physical sacrifice these guys put in 60 minutes, not just in a, it does not, not just once a week in a game, but throughout the season, throughout practice, throughout training camps, everything that goes, the, the catalog of things that go into being uh, being an offensive lineman, I really think that award, award is, is pretty important. Although, uh, I, I should I should stipulate that by saying, at the end of the day, although you know it's important, you know I don't think you're ever going to see an offensive lineman win, you know, most outstanding oh, player. But player? you know, yeah. but either way, either way, it's it's a, it's a tremendous award and uh, deserves a, a, a hell of a lot of recognition. So the revelation that came out uh, about Chad Owens having played since October 8th with a broken hand make what he did this season even more incredible. I absolutely think so, Jen. I was there with Don Landry when we were when when he was discussing that with Chad, and you know it was one of the things that Chad I think did his best to conceal. Although going back now and looking at and thinking about everything, I mean, you could just see all the signs in terms of not necessarily how he played, but just looking at himself in the locker room and and how he had you know how his glove looked on his on his left hand, and he. You can't take away anything that Chad Owens did. I think really this is the, this is the 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 peak of his career. I really think we're seeing now the peak of who Chad Owens is and and what he can offer not just the Toronto Argonauts but the whole Canadian Football League. This guy is is a fantastic athlete, just a tremendous, tremendous. Um, not just not just a tremendous physical specimen. You know, people looked at his size and said, you know, too small, does too many things, gets too gets too battered around too much. Honestly, the guy always comes up big, no matter what you put into him. And it's funny, I was talking to several people about this, about med- uh, and comparing how many times he is on the field a game throughout the season, how many touches he gets. And you have to think maybe next to someone like Andrew Harris, you know, those two players probably get the ball more than anyone else in this league. They probably touch the ball more than any other offensive player. And that is, and besides the quarterback, of course. But that is just, but that is just tremendous. And yeah, I, I think that it just adds a little bit. It's, it's, it's that little shade. It's that little bright shade that you put on a, a championship season. Because usually these kind of things uh, are revealed at the end. When everything else, when all the confetti clears, there's, there's usually a particular story that's pretty fantastic. And I think that Owen story was, was, pretty, was pretty amazing. And, you know, when we look back on it, when everything, when it all settles after parade, I think Chad Owens is going to go down. What he did this year, regardless of maybe my um, my 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 naive and and maybe in some people's perspective rightfully stupid opinion about uh, you know not not picking him for out, for uh, outstanding player, I really think when all that clears, we're all going to we're going to think of this as as really the year that Chad Owens became a superstar in the CFL. The awards are done. We get down to the game. I mean, yes, there's a lot of other really cool stuff going on during the week, but it's primarily a football show. So let's talk about you know the game. Huge controversy, first of all, over the Stamps horse. Would it be allowed to run? In, would it be allowed to run in the Rogers Center? Would it not be allowed? It turns out to be almost a moot point because if not for that late touchdown, it wouldn't have had a chance to run anyway. Um, and there really wasn't any room on the sidelines. No, so, but did, uh, but I, 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 you and I were kind of looking at some point, and just kind of looking. And even though there might have been a, a strip of a strip of astroturf right at the very end on the Argo side of the uh, the field, I. I think you know what I'm not going to diminish it by saying it was pretty ridiculous. I am not. This is in no way on the fault of of the Calgary Stampeders or the Calgary Grey Cup Committee or anyone associated with that organization or city. I think it's totally on. And and after all the good he did, I'm not going to blame Chris Reg personally, but I think it could have been had it handled a little better. Uh, particularly, you know, this the the whole side story of the horse and not being allowed into the Royal York Hotel, and then just the logistics problems with it actually, you know, being able to run in the stadium. I think that all could have been could have been taken care of in a in a better way. The one thing that I always find frustrating, and I'm not blaming anybody with the league because I worked for the league during the Great Cup, but the one thing I, I just find frustrating is how everything you usually hear is reactive rather than proactive. The league could have discussed this with the Stampeders um, off the off to the side even beforehand. Uh, there, there, you know, you could have discussed it before the West Final, just kind of saying, "Hey, you know what? Uh, we'll, you know, just in case you guys win, we'll, you know, let's this is how we're going to deal with this. And this is we're going to how we're going to deal with this." It wasn't. I don't think it was handled properly. But like you said, in the end, it really didn't matter because, you know, when when it really counted, the the, the Stampeders couldn't put up any touchdowns. One tidbit bit about the game is that the numbers have come in, and it was the most watched 
ever English language television event in Canada, with 5.8 million just, people watching. That's that's just that's just amazing when you think about. You know, sometimes we think about the size of this country and and the different regions, but to see what this game was actually able to do and how it brought, I think, the most important thing. And I know you've even I've discussed this before, Jen, bridging demographics. The uh, the the fact is is that the CFL demographic as a whole throughout the country is an aging demographic, and to see them bring in that many people, you would think what it does is it pulls in different people, different demographics, new Canadians, new people being introduced to the CFL. Yes, it is the Grey Cup, so it is a difficult metric because, like the Super Bowl, it, the numbers are a little skewed because there's going to be a peak and the baseline. You can't really adjust it for the regular season. But as Mark Cohan said, they experienced a surge in the television viewership. I think that is fantastic. I think it shows, again, that maybe cliche tagline of an invitation to the nation really paid off. It again, you know, ultimately it's about what happens next year. It's about the hangover. It's about what what the league does to sustain that, particularly in southern Ontario. Um, you know, it, they they unlike last year before the ninety ninth Great Cup, Commissioner Mark Cohan said, Listen, I don't I'm a little disappointed with the viewership in, 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 in southern Ontario and in Saskatchewan, but that was a byproduct of, of, of the Argos and, Stan, and the Rough Riders, excuse me, not necessarily having fantastic seasons. But to see that, to see that bounce back, I think, again, proves that there is a value to the CFL in this country. We talk about hockey. We talk about baseball. We talk about basketball. We talk about NFL football being the big four sports in North America, particularly hockey and how the, you know, so many people dismiss it as an obsession contrived by um, media outlets. This shows that there is a different passion within this country that people care about Canadian football. And when you think back to all the troubles that the CFL has had over the last 25 years, um, particularly, particularly in the last 10 to 15, because 10 to 15 years ago, many people were questioning even the, the overall viability of the, of the CFL going into the new millennium. When you see those kind of numbers and you see the way people on the ground in Toronto embrace the game, it's, it was so different even from 2007. I was walking the streets when the Saskatchewan uh, Rough Riders and Winnipeg Blue Bombers played, and it really... You, because even though the, the, the crowd was huge, but you wouldn't have known there was anything but just a big game on the day. There were there were there were crowds of people packed for you know five, six, seven days. This is a tremendous accomplishment for the league. But now it is up to Mark Cohan to say, what do we do now? We have the capital, we have the interest, we have the public's eyes. How do we how do we go ahead and, and solidify? these demographics? How do we pull these people in to make sure that they stick with the CFL? I think that is a challenge, and I don't think it's something that, you know, you just easily go into next year saying, well, we're just going to hope that everyone sticks and watches the CFL and watches the product we have. I think they're going to have to think about um, new and different ways of bringing people in. I don't know what those what those things are. I'm not paid what Commissioner Mark Cohen is paid to think on those kind of things, but I think that is the challenge going into the next year, the hangover and what the league does with it. Especially considering that you know the Toronto market stood a huge growth. I mean, there was uh, more than 3.6 million people in the Toronto market alone were watching the game. That's almost 50% of their population, which is yeah. amazing for them. And uh, for all the people who were criticizing the halftime show, and I'm one of them, uh, yeah, the halftime show drew an, with an average audience of 6.1 million, so more than actually watched the game. And, on and you know what? I, I listen. I'm not a fan of Justin Bieber or Carly Rae Jepsen or Mariana's Trench, and <laughs> to, you know, not to not to aid, not to date myself, but I'm not. I'm not old enough to have a real, real strong appreciation from Go for Gordon Lightfoot, as uh, you know, apart from him being just a, a kind of vestige of of of, of a more uh, of an innocent time in this country when we we kind of uh, when we were kind of starting to to take pride in our, our our artists. But I have to tell you, these stories about there being boos, like like, and there were boos for Justin Bieber. There were boos leading up to him performing, and perhaps, perhaps they piped in some cheers. But it wasn't like people were throwing tomatoes at the kid. It, people in the in the stadium were in their seats. People did not leave in the stadium. They were not. They weren't like throwing down all kinds of 
you know, just insults and 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 just kind of invectives to to kind of throw the kid off of what he was doing. They, they were enjoying it, or at least quietly enjoying it, or whatever. I think <laughs> it, it, it. I think that I think it was easy to look at the halftime show as an excuse to find something wrong with the game. I wasn't my cup of tea. I didn't really pay attention to it, Jen. You were sitting beside me the whole time. You, I wasn't paying attention to it. But people, some people like it. That draws in a younger demographic. Most of those people are probably not going to stick with Canadian football. But whatever. It 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 did what it had to do on the night, and I don't see any problem with it. I thought it was yeah. weird. I think I think the one act halftime shows are slightly more cohesive. So then you can just get on. Oh, you off the set change in the middle. You don't have any kind of leg in the middle. But in the same sense, it's the hundredth. You guys, you try something different and. 6.1 million people tuning in isn't exactly it's not bad numbers for you know a 10 minute halftime show but no. I mean the game as much as the Twitter sphere and all that would have us believe the game is a lot more than just a halftime show um, yes. the game there was actually a football game on either side of that halftime show did Toronto win or did Calgary lose that's yeah, so that I think a lot of the people are framing it that way Jen when you look at it I I, I think in a way and I know because I was you've already heard my stories about some of the the to the Toronto Argonauts being not to being too happy that I, I chose I picked Calgary, but the fact is I think that largely Calgary lost this game. They had a chance early on. Remember this was a Calgary this was a Calgary offense that had exposed um both the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and the B C Lions the previous two weeks and they were unable to break down um, the Argos, and I think that's a tremendous cre- credit to Chris Jones uh, and his defense. As Ahmad Carroll, the, the Argos cornerback, told me, "Listen, we're, we, I don't know why the Rough Riders were playing zone de- zone defense against the, um, the, the the Stampeders a couple weeks ago. I don't know why the BC Lions weren't doing anything or didn't look to be doing anything, but the Argos, Carroll told me, were going to play man to man the whole time, and it just didn't seem as if Calgary could make any adjustments." Kevin Glenn, I know a lot of people are going to go ahead and say he didn't really rise to the occasion, but I think a lot of blame has to go to, to the offensive coordinator Dave Dickinson. This was a guy, according to Kevin Glenn, who had everything ready and planned and was going to make the adjustments and was ready to to just make himself uh, willing and prepared to challenge Jones, to force Jones to make adjustments, to force Jones to do different things. He was going to engage Romby Bryant. He was going to engage Maurice Price. He was going to make sure John Cornish was a, was a viable part of this game. And Dave Dickinson did none of those things. The fact is, is the Argos didn't need to change their game plan. They were man. They were man pressure. They they were disguising some of their blitzes. They were moving guys around and. <laughs> You know, I know everything I'm saying makes it seem like the Argos won the game, and they did. They deserved to win. They were the better team, but Calgary did nothing, and it's not like they didn't have an opportunity. Ricky Ray and the offense did nothing in the second half. They were just really ineffectual. But you also look at the other things that came in for the Argos. Uh, Look, if Keon Raymond doesn't have that horrendous holding call on Matt Black in the third quarter, Perhaps we're talking about this differently. The Argos were ripped wide open by Larry Taylor on that that 105 return uh, return touchdown. Keon Raymond today said, "I'm going to have to go ahead and deal with that, just like Brian Bratton will have to deal with his missed catch a couple of weeks ago." The Argos, I'm not going to call them lucky breaks, but the Argos really benefited, and for two straight weeks with teams just not taking advantage of the moment. And the Argos, I had for so long assumed that this team was going to crack at some point. I just was not a believer. I had I have watched this team throughout the year. I've watched them be a 500 team. You flip the coin from week to week, and it differed on the kind of Argo team you're going to get. Scott Milanovic not only proved me dead wrong, he proved a lot of people wrong. This Argo team was ready when it counted. Milanovic was just all intense all week. You know, didn't you know showed emotion, but it was kind of a a almost antagonistic emotion to the point where he just look, even after when he was getting the Gatorade bath, he just seemed like he was doing it to show people up, to show people that even all the doubters, no matter you know that how dare you doubt a nine and nine team, we were going to seize the moment. Quite frankly, they did, and Calgary could do nothing. And I think that is going to be the big regret for John Huffnagel, that when he came in, I think he thought, like all of us, that the Argos were going to break, that the Argos were going to be the team to to blink, and they weren't. At the end of the day, the pressure got to Calgary, and they just didn't know what to do with it. And the Argos gift-wrapped first play off of scrimmage in the first quarter. Ricky Ray throws an interception. Argo fans everywhere are looking at each other going, oh, God, this is going to go bad. Because historically... 
when the game starts off like that, the Argos have had a hard time recovering. Oh, they kind of exactly. get off to a bad start, and you just keep, you just keep going. Calgary doesn't recover. Like Calgary makes no points on that. Two and out, punt back. So Toronto dodges the bullet there. Because if it had been seven nothing early on for the Stamps, we might have been, but, we'd be talking about a very different game. Yeah, probably you know perhaps. And you know what? The fact is, when I look back on two specific games throughout the year, the, a loss to BC at home and a loss to Edmonton at home, the Argos. Ricky Ray threw two interceptions in the first quarter. In fact, I think he threw two interceptions on his first, you know, three or four series, and it really kind of dictated the pace. But again, the surprising thing here is that the Argos, as they had in previous game, as they had in the East Final against Edmonton, and as they, as excuse me, not the East Final against Edmonton, the East Semifinal, and as they did against the East Final in Montreal, they just had no problem adjusting. They had no problem. Just moving from a dip, from, move, from flipping the page in the playbook and saying, if this isn't going to work, we're going to try this. You can just look at the way Jack Hackard played. This was a guy who, whenever, and and you know, we had a good enough view, Jen, in the press box that we could see the little changes that Calgary was making. Whenever Calgary made an adjustment up the defensive line, the offensive line, Toronto's offensive line, which I'm sorry, and I've spoken to Chris Panzel and Jeff Keeping throughout the year, was woeful at times, was not very good. The fact is is that they gave Ricky all kinds of time. They gave Cackard all kinds of time to move off their blocks. This was a team that I, I really think when you when you know, maybe this maybe this is a turning point for the Argos organization in this way. For so long, perhaps ever since the Flutie years with only one blip in oh four, the Argos were seen as a team that just didn't seem to be developing. That just a team that was spinning their wheels that he sure had a great year in 2010 when they were nine and nine, but went into Montreal and got completely—I won't say embarrassed, but they got, you know, completely just broken down thoroughly by the Alouettes. But this was a team that was so surprising because, in the way it was—it's so efficiently executed its playbook. Scott Milanovic had talked, you know, throughout the year about shortening the field, about move, about moving Ricky through his progressions, and you could visibly see Ricky moving through his progressions. By contrast, Kevin Glenn, totally confused. Didn't know what he what he could do. Didn't know what he should do. And John Cornish, for the third straight game this year, he was held under a hundred yards by the Argos. Really, he was held under. You know, his, this was his best game of the year because he had over fifty. He had over fifty yards uh, of, against the Argos. And he said, you know, and I quote verbatim: "If I don't get a hundred yards." On Sunday, I will be really surprised. Well, he looked really surprised after the game when he said, that "When the big boys came out, we weren't ready." That's very true. I mean, Cornish was shoved back for a loss a lot of times. Every time he tried to find a hole, there seemed to be three or four Argonauts there. And this is not the same Argonaut team that was being beaten on the run by both Edmonton and Montreal, and was pretty shaky on run defense all season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's there's no doubt about it. But I think really. What, and I spoke to Jordan Younger about this for a piece for CFL.ca. Ultimately, I, I think when you when you take a look at the strength of this Argo team, you really have to look at its secondary. There was no one. I don't care who you are, and I followed the Argos. I was there at every you know ninety percent of practices throughout the year. I don't care what you, anyone thinks. This de- no one thought this defense could do what it did. No one thought this secondary could do what it did, especially after you lose Willie Pyle. Lynn J. Shell and Byron Parker, three incredibly important pieces in that secondary. And to see guys like Ahmad Carroll, Jalil Carter, Pacino Horn, you know, rally around some like Jordan Younger, even extending into the linebackers with Marcus Ball, to see those guys rally around Jordan Younger and to see them just feed into this idea that if I do my job, everything else is going to work out fine. It came to fruition. Maurice Price and Romby Bryant and Markway McDaniel did not do anything. I know that they had some catches. I know they had some receiving yards, but you know this was a team that just sliced open the Lions and the Rough Riders. The biggest play that the uh, that the Calgary Stampeders had that wasn't called back for a penalty was a 62-yard catch and run by uh, Nick Lewis. That should have changed the game had it not that the Argos. I think, and I could be wrong on this. I, I, the Argos just made the adjustment and and had a different kind of pressure package. And you see EJ Kowali come up and stuff the um I, I think it was on a it was on, it was on a short yardage play just near the goal line stop the stampeders everyone bought in i do my job everything will turn out fine and it did at the end of the day the toronto argonauts just proved to everyone in the cfl that they are a team not of destiny i hate that term i absolutely loathe that term they are a team of the moment when when the lights come on 
when the big stage is ready, these Toronto Argonauts prepare. And I know that a lot of Argo fans, a lot of people across, and, and they've heard me say, a lot of CFL fans say it, that I didn't think this Argo team could rise to the occasion because they lost to BC twice, regardless of how close they were. Because they had lost three straight in September, five of six between August and September, and, 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 into, and, in, and into October, this team rose to the occasion when it had to. That's why Scott Milanovic, Chris Jones, Orlando Steinauer, Steve McAdoo, that entire coaching staff deserves so much credit because they got their players prepared and their players just simply executed. We kind of have to mention the belly incident. I have no good answer for as to why, because when I asked him the question about why he attempted to pull a Khalif Mitchell and rip off an arm, all I got was a kiss in return. So, and a big smile. And, like, the quintessential belly grin, but no answer. But, you know, honestly, that, that, that is what Roundry Adrenal Belly was brought, was brought in for. I mean, if you if you think about what a an Adrenal Belly in his mid-30s could offer the Toronto Argonauts, he wasn't suddenly going to come in late in the season and sack everybody and just and just be the dominating defensive force that Chris Jones needed on the line. That wasn't going to happen because they had Kevin Huntley and Armand Armstead in the defensive tackle position. Belly came in as a big body with the reputation to piss people off, to get in their helmets, to make sure that his job was to agitate. His job was to be the guy that took on the persona of being the bad guy that so many people in the league thought the Argos were. This was a team that led the league in penalties, led the league in frustrating penalties, like offsides, like uh, procedure, like, pat- like pass interference. I mean, this was a, this was a team... Well, actually, they didn't lead the league in pass interference, but this was a team that just seemed to be making all the mistakes, and Belly came in and took the pressure off everyone because he said, he's not a clown, but he said, I'm the guy who dances around and makes a show of himself. I'm the guy who draws attention. That's not your job. My job is to go ahead and get everyone's helmets. My job is to tell Anthony Calvillo in the East Final, hey, AC, I don't have a ring on my finger because you screwed up and you lost us the 2006 Great Cup. That's what that's what Belly is supposed to do, and he is a not only that, but when he does that, he can use all his other tools. And even though he has a reputation for not necessarily being a guy in the gym and all that, he is a fierce competitor. And the fact that he was able to just break bodies, get in there, get in people's heads, I think really makes him a, a, a just makes him a symbol of a turning point in this season. He became the bad guy that the Argos, everyone thought the Argos were, and everyone thought the Argos were too reckless to really seize the moment. Belly, when the moment counted, am I condoning what he did? Absolutely not. I think it was horrendous, and I think the league should probably fine him. If not, if he comes back next year, should suspend him for a game. No player should yank another player's arm out of his socket. But he did what the Argos needed him to do. I'm not saying he was dictated to, but he knew that when the time came, he was going to have to go ahead and get, and get in somebody's head. And how, what better thing to do than to get in the head of, of, of the center, to get into, into the head of center John Gott, and really unsettle that, that Stan Peters offensive line, which, with all due respect to them because they had a great season, did not show up when they needed to. I think speculation is that Belly is going to retire, go back, yeah. ride back up into the phone set, um, how many other players played their last games? Yeah, that's a tough question. I think that uh, I think overall the Argos team is young. I think pieces, particularly like Jordan Younger, Kevin Huntley, Ronald Flemons, some of the some of the more older guys, um, perhaps. Uh, I, I think they should come back, and I think they will come back. You look at someone like Jeff Johnson, though. You look at someone like Noel Prefontaine. Uh, and perhaps we've seen the last their last games. I don't. You know, Jeff Johnson is a is a physical freak. He's just in tremendous shape and the nicest man. And he, what more does he have to prove? He's had a fantastic career, two great cups. Uh, really, I think one of the underappreciated pieces, Noel Prefontaine, one of the best kickers in CFL history. Um, even though I know he's a competitor and wants to come back, he, he suffered a labrum tear, had surgery, came back, really when the Argos needed needed him to come back to be a punter, to again, like Belly, be a calming influence. He did that. He did his job, and he won a great cup. I don't see the reason for him to stay stay around. But when you look at all the other pieces of this Argo team, you look at that offensive line, it's fairly young. You look at that um, receiving core, also fairly young, particularly Dontrell Inman, who had a fantastic game. Ricky Ray, 33 years old, 
the dude could play for another three, four, or if he goes into eight, goes into the AC stretch, the dude's got another seven seasons, which is, when you think about it, unbelievable. Although I do, the one piece on the Argos I do think that will not be there next year is probably Armand Armstead. He has spoken several times in a very coy way about how this game was was an opportunity for him to prove himself. The Great Cup is always a stage for NFL scouts to come in, and there's no doubt that there are people who will be looking at Armand Armstead. And as Kevin, as excuse me, Ronald Fleming said to me, I hope he's played his last game because he could be so good in the NFL. Um, that again is not to bring up the metric between the CFL and the NFL, but if you just look at the kind of physical athlete that Armand Armstead is. And the way he pulls back into coverage, the way he can use his size and speed and, and agility. I mean, the dude has everything that a that a uh, defensive coordinator in the NFL would want. However, you know, you take a look at the um, the Stampeders, the big question is what happens to Kevin Glenn next year? Drew Tate will be healthy, hopefully. Uh, whatever the ailment actually was, hopefully he'll be ready to go and probably will be. Bo Levi Mitchell, um, John Huffnagel clearly loves this kid because he came in in relief of, of, of Glenn for a couple of plays and has a strong arm. Just to watch this kid throw the football during practice la- uh, last week was just amazing. Kevin Glenn, although he won the Stampier's 10 games and he, and he took them to a great cup, um, I just Huffnagel might start to worry about whether or not he is the guy to lead them all the way if they need him to lead them all the way. And that's, that's sad because Kevin Glenn is one of the top uh, 15 passers in CFL history. He actually is. I mean, the stats don't lie. The dude has is I think 11 or 12 in passing yards in CFL history. That's an amazing accomplishment. Kevin Glenn was able to get to the stage that he needed to. He wasn't able to produce, and that is unfortunate. But you look at other pieces in this um, in this Stampeders lineup. Nick Lewis said he's coming back. Uh, whatever you think about his size and his attitude, this, the dude clearly he was the best stamp. He was he was Stampeders most um, lethal offensive weapon, and maybe that's not saying much. But to look at other parts of the Stampeders team. I don't know what's going to happen. I think I think the one question we're all going to be watching is what happens to Dave Dickinson. So many people have pegged him as the uh, as as a future head coach. I think the only unlike last year where we had I think four vacancies that were filled um, in Saskatchewan. Uh, Winnipeg, or no, excuse me, not Winnipeg, excuse me, Saskatchewan, Toronto, Hamilton, and BC. Um, I think the one vacancy we're going to have this year is in Edmonton, uh, depending on what Cavis Reed decides to do or what the, Edmont- uh, the Eskimos decide to do with Cavis Reed. And it'll be interesting to see if Dave Dickinson goes there to become the head coach, or perhaps maybe Chris Jones, the, the, uh, the Argos defensive coordinator, goes over to become the head coach. So there are a lot of storylines between these two teams, and I don't necessarily think either one of either the Argos or the Stampeders are going to look uh, similar in that going into next year. The most outstanding player of the Grey Cup, um, Chad Cackert, is unsigned. Is a free agent as of what, February 15th? Yep. I believe. But is in negotiations with the Toronto Argonauts. So. No, I, I, I suspect that they, 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 they will attain Chad Cackert. I think he'll get a nice, and again, in CFL terms, he will get a nice <laughs> raise. Um, uh, I, I just think that... At the end of the day, the Argos need to keep this nucleus together. They need to keep Chad Cackard happy. They need to keep Ricky Ray happy. They need to keep all of these pieces together simply because they have now they have now built a winner, and consistency is key in not only defending a championship but um, maintaining your profile in any city. And if the Argos can do that, uh, I think there will I think they will be well on their way to fulfilling. The promise that uh, Chris, that executive Chris Rudge made, not just to the organization but to the city, that the Argos would matter. But it is it is vital. It is absolutely vital to make sure that those important pieces on that team, and some of them will be looking for raises at some point. And I am talking about Brandon Isaac and Marcus Ball and Robert McHugh and all those linebackers. And I am talking about. Well, uh, certainly not Ricky Ray, but Chad Cackard and maybe Chad Owens. Um, and maybe a veteran like Jordan Younger. I mean, the, the, it is going to be very, very, very important because he's due, because this is still a salary cap league for Jim Barker to keep all of those guys happy. And even himself, Jim Barker, remember, doesn't have an extension. So, um, you know, he's got one year left remaining on his contract. It'll be vital to, for him, you know, vital for Chris Rudge, too, to make sure that everyone stays happy because if this if this good thing is broken up for whatever reason, uh, you know, the first the Argos could be right back to square one next year. Any other great storylines? I mean, that, yes, it's what Chad Cackert's coming at party. Um, people in Toronto 
I guess have very short memories because it's a case of Corey Boyd who. Um, yeah. I don't know that anybody, like until the game was played, I don't think anybody was 100% on the whole cutting of Boyd for Cocker. I think that Cocker's performance may have solved that deal. There's also the fact that there weren't as many people watching the Argos when they cut Corey Boyd. There's a whole group of fans well, who don't even know about Corey Boyd. Yes. Uh, they, 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 you know what? I spoke to Chad Cackard about this several times, and the, the guy has a very dry sense of humor, and he's always said that what I'm doing is not that big of a deal because this is what I've been doing all the time. Remember, and, and Jen, you and I have spoken about this, Chad Cackard had a very, very strong group of acolytes who, who constantly thought that Chad Cackard deserved a bigger spot in this team. He got it. Remember, Chad Cackard was on the practice roster for the first third of the season. To see him come out and play the way he's played, particularly in the last two weeks, again, another symbol of this team preparing what it had to. I just think that it makes him among now, and I and I and I'm not going to mince words when I say this, you know, one of the top running backs in this league, you know, a lot because he can do the things that are required of running back in the CFL. We have now entered an age, I firmly think, of the dual threat back, of the back that can both receive out of the backfield and run. Andrew Harris does it. Um, Hugh Charles does it in Edmonton. Corey Sheets does it to a certain extent. Um, you know, it's it's been do, it, they've been doing it in Montreal with Brandon Whitaker and before him Avon Coburn. This is a league um, where you need to do that as a running back, and I think Chad Cacker does that, and I think he could be a huge star in this league. And I think when you now look at the Argos offense, Dontrell Lindman. Chad Cacker, Chad Owens, and Ricky Ray. If everyone if everyone stays happy, this will be a very, very, very tough offense to deal with in 2013. And I've already had my first email with odds for next season's Grey Cup, uh, and the Argos are third um, behind both BC and Calgary. I don't know, but I mean, there's a long there's a long off season to come, and a lot of things can change in a lot of places, not just in the two cities that were in the Grey Cup, but in every CFL city, there will be change. That's one certainty of the off season. Yes. No team stays the same from one year to the next. Yeah, but I don't think we're going to see as as, as wide changes as we did last year, Jen. I mean, we had so much to talk about last year because there were coaching changes and personnel changes, and both the Argos and the Tie Cats, you know, cut and added and changed and traded and swapped and fixed and painted and restructured so many different parts of their lineup. Um, but I think when you take a look at particularly what's going to happen in Winnipeg. Um, and particularly, most importantly, what will happen in Edmonton, I think what you what we're really going to see is some changes uh, with particular teams. I mean, what does Joe Mack do? How does he go ahead and reinvigorate that blue that Blue Bombers team that, despite you know a couple wins at the end of the season, really was horrible throughout the throughout the bulk of the year? What happens to the general manager list and Edmonton Eskimos, who are missing so many players on their defense? I mean, my goodness. We could we could actually be dealing with a situation where what happens if JC Sher what what happens if the Toronto Argonauts sign JC Sherrod and you know Jack Hacker goes over to the Eskimos I mean that's all ridiculous and, and just that's that, that that sounds absurd to even say it but you know those are the kind of changes we could be looking at but um, I don't think we'll, that it'll be as widespread I think things will move gradually but I still think we're going to have a lot to talk about in the off season let's let the uh, Toronto Argonauts enjoy their victory parade and kudos to them for. You know, believing in themselves, even when not everybody else believed in them. Because it was very clear that that team, despite what anybody may be saying, be it media, be it fans, be it anyone, they believed in themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. And I think that's, as I as I sent Scott Milano, which is a text, I said, um, Coach, and this is verbatim, I said, Coach, uh, you proved me wrong. You proved so many people wrong. You have an awesome staff. You have awesome players. But in the end, you already knew that, didn't you? So, and he just sent me a, he just sent me a very short text back saying, thanks, and, uh, you know, appreciate the kind words. There is nothing but confidence in, in the way Scott Milanovic conducts himself and now in the way the, his team conducts itself. And uh, I think... Uh, I, I, I am now I am now a believer in these Argonauts, and I really think we could be uh, we could be seeing not I won't say the D word in, as in dynasty, but I think we could start to we, we we might be able to see a the the building of a new tradition in in Toronto, a winning tradition, which uh, which might help the Argos and and their place in this city. Thank you so much, Matt. Well, you know, thank you very much, Jen, for 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 having me on throughout the year, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening, and uh, enjoy a short rest, as you said, Jen, because. Uh, 
you know, we, we talk now, but a year passes quickly, and uh, it, it won't be long before we're talking about preparations towards the 101st Great Cup in Regina next year. And welcome to the championship edition of Rouge Radio. I'm Kevin Garbuio, joined by Jim Mullen from Crown Canadian University Countdown. We got the showdown we wanted, but we didn't get the results we wanted in the second half. Let's go through what happened and what an interesting game to McMaster losing to Laval. Well, we had a lot of fun watching the first half, and I think the way that the first half ended really gave us some sort of promise that, that we would have a game that was that was at least 70 or 80% as exciting as last year's game in Vancouver. Uh, but Laval, uh, I think, showed that uh, they have the coaching, they have the depth, uh, that they have the ability to adjust. Uh, and uh, really, I think if you take a look at this game, it really came down to a team that was physical versus a team that was athletic. And on this night, physical won. It looked like they just beat up McMaster on the line of scrimmage. They handled the lineman of the year award with the Aguilar. They got to Quinlan and beat up Quinlan, the head crane a winner. And it seems at times they really outcoached the coach of the year, Stefan Potasic. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, uh, when when you take a look on, on – well, really there's three sides of the ball in this game – uh, first of all, take a look at the uh, Laval offense. Uh, they weren't going to beat you with Tristan Grenon, the quarterback. And a matter of fact, uh, he threw for under 50% on the night. Uh, but uh, what they did was it was a war of attrition. They eventually ground down the uh, McMaster front seven. Uh, you bring up Daguilar, uh, I show as well. Uh, those two guys were the difference makers against the Calgary Dinos. Uh, uh, last week in the bowl game. Uh, they were able to move around. Uh, they were be able to use their speed. I was surprised, actually, uh, that Calgary uh, didn't use more zone read to try to freeze the speed. And, and actually, at the start of this game, I was surprised that Laval wasn't moving their quarterback around just a little bit more uh, to kind of freeze the speed of these guys. But they obviously... Uh, the Laval Rouge or coaches saw something that uh, that I wasn't seeing, and that they felt that they could physically wear down uh, the front seven of the um, of the McMaster Marauders, and that's exactly what they did. You could uh, you could see it in the third quarter. You could see how they were um, sealing off uh, the linebacker on either side. Um, and uh, letting Bhutan uh, run wild. I mean, once Bhutan got into the into the second level, uh, he could uh, crank off games of 17, 20, 25, and even that uh, long run for the touchdown, which I think was the uh, nail in the coffin. Uh, so, you know, uh, on the uh, on the defensive side of the ball for the McMaster Marauders, uh, uh, I think they were simply beaten into the turf as uh, as the game went along. Uh, for McMaster, when they were on offense, it was another uh, uh, situation of, uh, of physical winning out over athletic. But in comparison to uh, to last year, I think the biggest difference uh, was that the McMaster Marauders were down to running back number four in their depth chart, and they didn't have a running game. Uh, Chris Pizzetta last year uh, allowed McMaster – to uh, to keep the Laval defense honest, and uh, and over the last couple of games, it's been Kyle Quinlan that's been the number one running back uh, out of the quarterback position for McMaster. Uh, that allowed uh, uh, Laval to to really bring a lot of pressure off the edges. It allowed them to rush four, five, and six, even seven in some cases, but mainly uh, mainly running five, uh, rushing five and six and getting decent pressure on the quarterback, keen on Kyle Quinlan, roughing him up. Uh, and uh, you could see a bit of frustration with Quinlan uh, um, as the game went on, especially in the second half. And I think finally, if we're taking a look at three sides of this thing, what a great effort uh, by Laval when it came to uh, to uh, special teams. Uh, Boris Bede and Guillaume Rieu. Uh, Bede the, it was uh, punting the life out of the ball. Uh, now, he's from France. And he would have to qualify as a uh, as an import to come into the Canadian Football League, uh, 
uh, I think uh, what we saw out of him uh, uh, at uh, Rogers Center was uh, something that was a professional performance. And Guillaume Rayou coming off of a off of a uh, concussion where he was rolled out like frickin' discount carpet uh, against the, uh, the the Sherbrooke Barre or and uh, he was questionable as the week went along. He had a fantastic night uh, returning kicks as well. And uh, if there's one area of the game where you really saw uh, the physical quotient uh, being cashed in upon by the uh, Laval Rouge or against uh, McMaster, um, it was on specials because they were laying some hats on people. They were very impressive especially in the special teams wise. Uh, what I noticed was just, People are saying, just talking to some people from players, especially around the OUA, they're saying that Mac seemed arrogant in their special teams coming in, especially with some of the return plays when they're 10 yards deep in their own end zone. And the, one of the ways to beat Laval is you have to win field position. And you could see, what was it, uh, at some times they were losing the net by 50 yards on kickoffs. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the the arrogance factor because I, I know managing the you know, Banya Cup last year uh, out here in Vancouver, uh, it was the Laval Rouge or that seemed maybe not arrogant, but certainly complacent coming into the game uh, last year. And you know, one year can turn a lot of things around. And I've heard some stories about McMaster in the week lead up to this game uh, about uh, not being. Uh, the same McMaster team in terms of attitude. Uh, it was swagger. It was a bit of strident uh, behavior, I think, uh, leading up to this game. And, and the folks at Laval were, were registering that. They were taking notes. They were using it as motivation. Um, so, you know, uh, winning can do a number of good things for a program. Uh, sometimes it just comes down into the way uh, the way that you manage the uh, the winning and and uh, I agree with you, Kevin. I think they were too cute by half on a lot of their uh, uh, special teams plays, and I think one of them that you're pointing out, uh, I believe, was in the third quarter where uh, the ball was taken at about the 15 yard line, and they tried to execute an end around while the while the uh, while the lead of the wedge on, on coverage teams was forcing them back towards the goal line and. Uh, they ended, uh, the McMaster Marauders ended up starting a, a drive at their own one-yard line. Which you can't do against Laval, which is, especially with how well they were playing. And the kick game, they were losing the kick game. I think it was uh, 25 net yards they were averaging on punch just because of Ryu's dominance. And he was he's one of the best returners in the country. Yeah, and, and you know, if there's uh, if there's one part of the game that can speak to uh, depth in a program, I think it's special teams. And uh, if you take a look at the the depth of the Rouge or in comparison to their um, Quebec counterparts, in comparison to the rest of the country, uh, these guys are, are really a three deep team. Uh, so uh, when you're running guys out there uh, on the specials, not to say that there aren't starters out there on the specials too. Um, uh, that that's where you can see uh, how frighten, frighteningly dominant the, the, the Laval team can be at times and, and how it bodes for their future uh, when you've got guys out there on special teams uh, that, 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 are, that are so potent and, and so focused on what they're doing. As we saw at times Plessy is dominating on specials and uh, Gaffon Nadon. So you have two of the best players in the country and then on special teams where they just have one job is to go straight. It's pretty it's pretty intimidating to go against those guys. Well, and and you know what? It's promising for both of them in terms of uh, starting a CFL career. I, I know that both of them uh, held back a year, and uh, this was the main reason that they were doing it. Uh, Gascon they uh, didn't uh, get the cash in with the third Metris Award that would have uh, set a record uh, for for the Metris Award. Uh, I know he was disappointed in that. Uh, but uh, both of them off to the Hamilton Tiger Cats uh, to, to the camp next year, and uh, because the, uh, they've been able to uh, to focus on on turning in not only a good effort on the defensive side of the ball, but also uh, on special teams, there will be a place for these guys. The only worry that I have about AGM is he, he's, he's frequently nicked. Uh, we, we've seen it in. Uh, both uh, championship games where his knee was a major concern in 2011 and his shoulder was a concern uh, in this game. Uh, but you know what? It's good when you have a player that has the ability to play through pain and play, uh, play through injuries like uh, Gascon, they don't count. 
And Hamilton really, they don't need too many defensive players, would you think? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they don't need too many de- defensive players who are good Canadian players. They might have been able to use them uh, this year. But you know what? Uh, I'll tell you something. The Hamilton Tiger Cats through MRX, who, who manage this event, um, mm-hmm. out of all the teams uh, in, in the Canadian Football League, I think they're the most supportive of uh, CFL talent. And it, it would be really nice to see the Tiger Cats cash in uh, on these two talents uh, that have represented themselves so well at the national level. Going back to the game, one of the big things and one of the big storylines going into it that people uh, who don't really follow Laval notice, if the game's close against the Rouge or going into the half, the team, the, the, uh, the opposition is in trouble. And we saw that again today. Why is Laval so good in the second half? Uh, six full-time paid coaches. That's where I'm going to start, and you can work your way out from there. Because when you have six coaches who are with the program um, 365 days a year uh, who are professionalized, as opposed to many CIS teams that pay two, two and a half, three coaches full-time and then really rely on honorariums and volunteers uh, to coach a coaching staff, it's not taking away from those guys who are Timers, but they simply do not have uh, the time and the focus and uh, even the professional study uh, to be so engaged in the game that, that, that you can be prepared to make changes and make alterations and make adjustments uh, to your game. Uh, these, guys, uh, these guys communicate 52 weeks of the year. They've got it down to a science. Uh, they, they know how to uh, they know how to make adjustments because they're all on the same page, and uh, the Laval program also has the ability um, to to bring in the, the best possible coaches into those positions uh, to, to hold down. So um, I think it starts with coaching, and then everything else is secondary. And that'll bring us to the next to the next portion. The Laval model. We've been talking about it for the last few weeks after Laval started ramping up these wins when this year was supposed to be the down year, the doom and gloom of earlier in the season where they were forced to relieve one of their offense coordinators and just coming back with Justin Eche. What is it and why do why does it give them such an advantage? Well, I wish the folks on TSN talked a little bit more about it too because it might have uh, – provided a, a little bit more in terms of uh, understanding about why Laval is uh, where they're at. Um, some people say the, the, the Tongues uh, in Quebec City are owners of the team. Nobody owns uh, the Laval Rouge Or, but they do have um, a healthy presence of a, a nonprofit corporation uh, that, that funds the football program. And, and those, um, those profits – are reinvested back into the program. And and at this point, you know, they started back in the mid-90s. At this point, with all of the success that they've had and the success that they've had at the gate and the success they've had in terms of marketing, uh, this is snowballing for them in terms of what they can do in terms of reinvesting uh, into facilities. Uh, they're reinvesting uh, uh, over this last period of time about $7 million into into facilities over these last few years. And that, of course, attracts recruits, which makes your team better, and that's where you get the snowball effect. Um, so it, the, the football team is done in partnership uh, between the nonprofit corporation with private money and the university. There are a few other models like this uh, in Canada, the new team starting up at Carleton is uh, is one of them. Uh, Sherbrooke down the road from Quebec City is another one of them who's had uh, moderate success and, and good success at the uh, at the gate. Um, uh, Guelph is is kind of one of them with Stu Lang right now putting a lot of money into into uh, facilities. Uh, uh, Saskatchewan, uh, even though David Dubé has put a lot of money into the into the football program and is contemplating putting more money into coaching, that is uh, really controlled uh, by the university uh, more in terms of decision-making than it is controlled by um, a, a private nonprofit corporation. Uh, maybe in Canada West, the only one that's truly a private nonprofit uh, corporation that runs uh, somewhat independently from the university 
is the Regina Rams. And, and I think the reason the Rams tend to struggle at, at one point or another is they don't have the same conditions that, uh, that the folks in Quebec City do. In Quebec, right now, with the Quebec Nordiques leaving uh, back when the Rouge et Or were starting up, there's a big dog in that town right now. And also the Tangay uh, family also owns the Quebec Ramparts, so there's a bit of a uh, sports empire and some cross-marketing going on there. Uh, the, the, the issue for the Rams is they play at Mosaic Stadium. They play in a 33,000-seat uh, CFL stadium. So even though we had 4,400 people there sitting in the snow for the semifinal, being very supportive, uh, during the course of the season, it, it's kind of hard to get that critical mass and that fervor in the set, in the stands uh, uh, started for for the Rams. So um, well, right now, Laval, is, with the uh, private-public partnership, is well ahead of everyone in the CIS. I think you'll see them as the favorite for the next two years at the very, very least. And, uh, you know, really it's up to the other 26 teams in the CIS to, to catch up and catch on. Well, I hear people complaining about uh, the the advantage Laval has, but one of the, as you mentioned, they have six full-time coaches. It pretty much, this is what you need now, is you need to be have great coaching as opposed to having the oldest player. And would you say this reliance on coaching, this reliance on this Laval model is kind of the opposite of the old junior model that was the mainstay in the, the way to build championships? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. And, and since the junior model of bringing older players in is, is off the table right now, this is really the only way. Uh, and I know with um, different universities, there are different cultures within those universities that will that will involve uh, donors and, and the private side in in different ways. Uh, and uh, I, you know, for instance, uh, at, at Western Ontario, they, they have a healthy donor base, but it's a team that that is run successfully um, uh, based upon uh, the, the the university directed model. Uh, with some of the things they're doing at McGill right now, in terms of the private money coming in, they've decided to make the reinvestment into recruiting and coaching. I believe they're up to four full-time coaches right now. Uh, Montreal's at five full-time coaches. Uh, uh, Sherbrooke has uh, has four and a half or five full-time coaches. Uh, you know, so when it, when I take a look at uh, say, for instance, uh, the Canada West or even teams in the OUA that are carrying two and a half full-time coaches, when the Saskatchewan Huskies have a have a defensive coordinator that's been with the team for over two decades and. And um, he wins the Geno Fracas Award because he's recognized as a volunteer coach. He's a defensive coordinator of a team that's won three Vanier Cups. Um, you, you start to, to realize why uh, the, the, the rest of the pack right now isn't getting traction against the Laval to the world. Uh, I think one thing that could really help uh, expose this and, and get other teams uh, up to the level of uh, a Laval or even a Montreal or a Sherbrooke in terms of their model is some sort of form of uh, of the national interlock. But I think we're still a few years away from that, yeah. The thing that I was noticing with uh, Laval and all their coaches, this is great for Canadian coaches and coaches in this country to get a job and actually build the game up because now that they're, this shows that there's a need and it creates a demand for, for coaching, though. Yeah, and you know what? In a lot of ways, um, if you're doing your job and, you're, and if you're uh, uh, developing players and with the university culture uh, taken into account, um, these jobs are more stable jobs for coaches, too. It also allows the coaches to develop uh, in comparison to the uh, revolving door policy with many uh, Canadian Football League teams. Uh, we've seen uh, one of the waves already of, of CFL guys going into the in, back into the university ranks or into the university ranks. Noel Thorpe and Danny Machocha are a pair that uh, that are in um, uh, Montreal. Um, Greg Marshall, of course, after he was let go by the Ticats a few years ago, went back to the OUA from McMaster. He went over to uh, to, to Western Ontario. I think you're going to see. Uh, more and more um, professional level coaches seriously consider uh, CIS jobs as as the CIS on the football side with the more progressive football operations 
gets more prof- as they get more professionalized. I find it interesting your, how you asked, mentioned the donors and donors going in and d- giving money to football. And you think of like schools like U of T for a period of time who said, no, you're not allowed to just donate to the football team. If you want to donate money, you have to donate to the school and we'll allocate. And I don't see yeah. too many teams doing that anymore. No, and and that that's a that's a surefire way to um, to to lose the enthusiasm of your donors. Uh, quite frankly, I know uh, UBC had a had a period of doing that, and I know that uh, there's a group that's popped up uh, in Vancouver called the Thunderbird Football Association that's starting to try to do things privately uh, apart from the university. But uh, really, if you take a look at uh, at models who have popped up like that, um, the fifth quarter in uh, Calgary is a group of um, of alumni that help subsidize the uh, the Calgary Dinos program. They're not involved in, and I was talking about different levels in terms of private involvement. They're not involved in the marketing of the game. They're not involved in the presentation of the game, but they are involved in terms of raising three hundred thousand dollars every year and then plowing that money back into scholarships and building the best team possible. Uh, I, I think that's a large part of the equation. But uh, if, if you're going to have private involvement in these teams, uh, I think it's equally as important to popularize the game. I think it's e- equally as important to sell the game. It's important to have bums in seats. It's important to have student involvement in the stands. It's important to have businesses in your local corporate community patched in and involved in the program. It's not, you know, there's going to be winners and losers at the end of the day uh, on the scoreboard. But uh, the one thing that football needs to provide to these universities is some sort of form of community. And you're not going to do it in some of these places just with a good football team. You need to take a look at all areas of the community. Uh, in some cases, find ways to monetize that. In some cases, just find ways to to get those parts of the community to uh, participate. And that's how you make uh, a a successful uh, football program. And I fully believe football is the curtain puller uh, in the season for the rest of of the uh, athletic department's uh, activities. A good football program uh, draws eyes and attention to the basketball season that follows. It draws some attention to soccer season if your school soccer team is in a championship it gives uh, it gives students in the community a destination to go to because football, quite frankly, when it comes to these CIS schools, it's it's the big deal. Well, we talked about this last week uh, uh, during the bowl games. We were saying that universities seem to not realize that they need to improve the in-game entertainment. They need to improve the the atmosphere in order to sell the game. And we were just talking now about when you're at a Laval game, it's a party. It's fun. It's like going to an SEC game down in the States where you have tailgating, you have parties, you have people in the seats singing. They main, they make it a fun, entertaining time. It's not the old school sit on your hands and just cl- golf clap crowds that we sometimes see at a lot of CIS events. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, it, it comes right back to what we've been talking about. It, it's, it's the private versus the institutional in, in a lot of cases, and, and the and the institutional side, which in most cases is the athletic department side, will take a look at a at a sports event on campus and say we're providing a service here for the students. When really the successful programs, when it's come to putting uh, people in the stadiums, have have taken a look at it and they go, how do we bring customers into the stadium? So it it, it comes down to a difference of are you know are we providing a, a service to a student who has um, who has paid his student fee uh, versus are we creating customers and are we treating these customers uh, the way uh, we'd like to be treated as customers are we focusing uh, on on services are we focusing on how hot the hot dogs are uh, are we you know are we focusing on the uh, on on the parking. Uh, you know, on, on all these little details. Uh, and are we creating an atmosphere where people can come together in tailgates like they do in, in, in Laval and they do to, to a certain degree in Sherbrooke? And, and, and in the case of a lot of these athletic departments, they're not even, they're not even aware of these questions. 
They're not even aware of this event management. But uh, I also think that um, when it comes to comparing football in Quebec uh, to football in other parts of the country, it really does come down to a bit of a culture issue, too. Um, you know, I'm an Anglo. You're an Anglo. Uh, we live in a in a society where we're very structured. Uh, we were talking uh, before they out at UBC, the drinking area, they literally have the people who buy beer uh, behind a metal fence. So it's like they're in an old WWF cage uh, at, in Quebec. You show up to have a good time. You can buy a beer. Uh, you can be an adult and, and you can watch a football game and, and, and have fun with your community. It's a, it's a, it's a totally different approach uh, in these two cultures to, to attending a sports event. Uh, yeah, I always love watching these games from, uh, from Laval because, uh, you know, for instance, uh, how many times do we now see in, in any place in English Canada where you're going to get uh, fans lining up six deep behind a rope in an end zone? They do that in Laval. And then the, it's a great atmosphere. I was there last week for the game. And that's probably that was my third time at a game at uh, Peps or Telestad or whatever they call it now, and it is just it's a party. I was uh, out talking to people at the tailgate and see the Acadia people who came in and talking to the Laval people, and it's not a contentious atmosphere. I don't I I don't know how it is when Montreal comes to town, but it's not contentious. It's very nice, no confrontations or anything. At the game, the Acadia fans were treated well. Everyone was having a good time. Sweet Caroline, everyone singing, dancing, having a blast, and it's an it's an event. It was a, and I think it might be because of the vacuum that was created when the Nordiques left. But it's still really fun. It's a great atmosphere, and more CIS teams should at least copy the Laval model of presenting a game. Well, the one thing that they have to realize, though, uh, and we're talking about other CIS teams if they want to be Laval, is. Um, you know, there's, it's funny, there's a few pictures out there if you go out and search the internet on, on Peps or uh, Stud Tell Us, uh, and, and you see where the start of it was in 1995 and, and, and how it was bleachers and a clearing and how this stadium has, has built up uh, from the mid-90s to, to what we have here in, in 2012. And it's making sure that your leadership has – has a long-term vision and, and has some goals and, 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 and sticks to those visions and goals, but also realizes that you're not going to have a Lavelle program in a year or two years. Uh, you know, just because you throw some money in a certain direction for, for one season or two seasons uh, and, and you don't get what you want doesn't mean that it's a failure. It means that you make little adjustments uh, to, to that path and you keep going in that path. These things don't happen in, in one- or two-year increments. They happen in five- and seven-year increments. That's the way change works with, uh, with, with football in, in this country and in the United States. Uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a building process, and actually a bit more of a slower building process uh, in Canada. So, so if, any, if any AD out there is, is listening to this, or any potential donor is out there listening to this, uh, they've got to realize that, that, that results don't come overnight, and you better be patient on, on that road. Well, moving with that, this year, the Vanier Cup in Toronto, tagging along again with the Grey Cup, seems to be a great idea, but recently you wrote an article saying that this might be the last thing, this might be the last time. Do you see this along with the plan? What is the plan for the future of the Vanier Cup? Now we go to the national level of it. Well, I think that uh, MRX, the company who uh, manages the Vanier Cup on behalf of uh, CIS, um, is at the end of their two-year deal. Uh, technically, they have another three years on their deal, and they're all option years. Uh, I believe MRX holds the option on each of them. Uh, but I, I've got word through various people at the CIS that the CIS is now interested in, in breaking off this deal and breaking away from this deal and walking away from this deal. And I'm not sure if CIS has really thought through the consequences of doing something like that. I think they might be thinking inside their own bubble rather than, than taking a look at, uh, at the net benefits and, and being, as I was just mentioning about building a program, uh, building this event up in a patient enough manner and sticking with a five-year plan 
to to deliver on the promise of it. 24,935 tickets were sold in Vancouver. 37,000 and change were moved in Toronto. The first uh, uh, the first 12 to 13,000 were tied into Grey Cup tickets, uh, but the rest of them were were sold at uh, at face value. Um, in the space of two years, the Vanier Cup has become a a um, an event that that is played at a very large university stadium to an event that's now being played at a CFL size stadium. To to think that 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 you can take a step back now and go to a facility, say like Quebec was a few years ago, without lights, or or you can go to a facility uh, uh, the size of uh, an expanded Griffith Stadium in Saskatoon, which was 11,000, is a huge leap back. You've got to be looking at facilities that are 20,000 uh, and and more. Uh, I know there are challenges right now uh, as they look forward to next year because uh, I've been to Mosaic Stadium several times, and I've been to Regina several times. And I can tell you that... Um, that city is, and that facility is simply not big enough uh, to uh, accommodate uh, the, the, the fans, the teams, um, and the officials uh, and the workers that come in associated with two events at the same time. It simply will not work in, in Regina this year. So they, they have to look outside of a, of a Grey Cup city and then go back to a Grey Cup pairing uh, for, for, for the uh, last two years. But the fact that I hear that CIS is, uh, is not interested uh, or, or is looking for a way maybe out of this deal, I think is alarming, uh, especially when you take a look at that. I haven't seen the overnight numbers yet on TV, but I can, I can guarantee you uh, that uh, you couple a uh, hockey lockout in uh, with the amount of hype that went into this uh, Vanier Cup uh, through the media to, to, to the province of Quebec and the province of Ontario, I'd be shocked if this uh, t- combined TV audience between English and French Canada isn't uh, in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 million. And those are, that would be the most number of eyes ever focused, I mean, by a wide margin, focused on a, uh, on a CIS event. So if the CIS wants to walk away from the deal with MRX, um, uh, they have to ask themselves, are we willing to walk away from pairing this game uh, with uh, with the Grey Cup because uh, I don't think that availability of them working with the CFL and uh, and working with the Grey Cup uh, will be uh, on the radar of either side then uh, for the next ten years and I think it could be a huge step back uh, for for the uh, for the CIS um, uh, I think there there's still room on the odd year here or there. Uh, for for a Vanier Cup to be played in a non Grey Cup city, this, this year coming up is a is a fine example of that. But say in 2014 when they when they play in Winnipeg, it would make sense to have a Vanier Cup in Winnipeg in 2014. That stadium is right beside University Stadium on the campus of uh, the University of Manitoba. If they play the uh, Vanier Cup, uh, rather the Grey Cup in in uh, Ottawa in 2015, as has been suggested. It would make sense to play the 50th Vanier Cup uh, in in Ottawa. I mean, it was uh, the Vanier Cup is named after George Vanier, the Governor General who donated the thing. And plus, you have uh, the Carleton University starting up in 2013, um, and then you have the Ottawa Rough Riders starting up in 2014. It will be a good football hotspot uh, to play uh, to play the Vanier Cup for a 50th anniversary there. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of strength in it. I think there are a lot of challenges behind the scenes. Uh, I really hope they stick with it. Well, I've been talking to people who are at the game, just seeing what has been said on Twitter, Rash Madani, that this is the hardest thing to believe right now. There's scalpers outside the Rogers Center scalping tickets to a Vanier Cup game. So it shows the demand to go to this game. There's a secondary market created. And then people at the game said the atmosphere was tremendous. One tweet I was reading said that the Blue Jays fans could learn from the atmosphere that was created. You, you touch on something, too, is that now as these events start to uh, pick up some momentum, uh, university sports in Canada can discover its brand. And when I say brand, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about a logo that says CIS on it. I'm talking about brand in terms of, 
uh, the, the different type of people and the different type of atmosphere those people create in the stands. Uh, a university uh, culture applied to a sporting event is going to be different than a CFL event or an NHL event or an NBA event. And part of, part of that uh, equation is the enthusiasm and the energy that's brought to the stands in that. And, and this, is, this is what I'm talking about in terms of, of having a five-year plan and not abandoning this thing, uh, you know, two years into it. Um, this was hopefully these last two years, and especially having 37,000 at this uh, last game, may have been a pivotal moment for the CIS um, if they can if they can stay focused on the future and stay on this path. Um, th- this could be a game changer for them. I sure hope it's not a one-off, and I think it's more likely to be a one-off if, uh, if they take a look at the current organizers of this event and think that they can go off and do it themselves. Because, you know, in the past, um, they've proven uh, that they can do it themselves on some occasions uh, by working with the host city. Uh, or a host organizer, and other times not so much. I, I think by sticking with the uh, with with one plan right now, they can develop a level of consistency with this product. Well, it should be, and I like how it's tied up with it, and I like uh, with the Great Cup and the fact that you get a ticket w- to this game as if you buy a Great Cup ticket and whatnot with that, and the tie-in and the lead-in, and especially with having TSN broadcasting advertising it it just allows this event to build and if you want to get attention to your sport you have to get attention to its biggest event and i haven't seen so much interest in a a cis game in forever well i guess the question now is how do you sustain it and that's a question i guess best left up to uh uh, the cis right now because they're the ones that are going to eventually uh, uh, make this uh, decision about how they want to sustain things uh, the one thing that needs to be mentioned is uh, when they paired up with the uh, with the Grey Cup, uh, they they lost some sponsorship in the process, and and, and I think they have a, a totally legitimate concern when when money goes out the door uh, that you know when you've got bills to pay, how do you pay those bills? Um, you know they had Desjardins on board uh, as a sponsor for the Vanier Cup. Well, when Desjardins realized that they could only get their their, their brand and their marketing out in a very limited way uh, within a Grey Cup city, uh, that's when they took a look at it and they said, this is not a good deal for us. So they walked away. So, um, you know, there's still a whole lot of work to do on that sponsorship side. And uh, and when you got bills to pay and you got a national office to run, uh, they, they certainly do have some legitimate concerns. Well, it'd be interesting to see because there was no real name sponsor, and as you you said, we're wa- you watch the game, you don't see all you see are the CFL sponsors, and I guess that's a bit of an issue. You're not going to transplant a field on a from Friday to a Sunday, so that's more logistic issues that are going to take place for the CIS. But it was nice to see some interest, which is, I guess, we miss out on the big picture monetary uh, concerns of the game. With this, we focus on just the game itself. Yeah, well, you know, but interest is a starting point, isn't it? If you got if you got a million and a half eyes watching on TV, if you've got thirty seven thousand in a stadium, and if you're doing it on the doorstep of corporate Canada, you would hope somebody in corporate Canada would pay attention to this and go, "Oh my God, we've got a great opportunity here uh, to to catch a demographic of of students and their families." Uh, that, that both have uh, a level of uh, either new income coming into the economy or disposable income. Uh, and uh, those are two target markets that, uh, that the uh, working class CFL doesn't necessarily uh, uh, touch a base on. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the CFL demographic, they're kind of the donut hole in, be- in between those two, uh, those two groups. So, uh, there, there are some there are some great marketing opportunities here, I think, uh, for corporate Canada to tap into. It's just a question of whether or not they're going to step up. Well, hopefully they do, especially as both of us and many other people are getting involved in on Twitter and with the chat forum started on Yahoo and CIS blog. Uh, different voices, different interests 
leading into this game. There's some people even commenting in there who weren't real C- – were just football fans but not CIS fans. So it was nice to see the pull that this game was having, and it seemed to have its own force that uh, was going forward. And we talked about this earlier in the year, how exciting it would be to have this rematch. And we seemed to get every match we wanted this year. We got Calgary-McMaster. We got Laval-McMaster. So it's really nice to see what's going on and everything moving forward. Well, I think I think the one thing that, that we really require uh, when it comes to university football in this country, and and I, I've certainly tried to make a contribution towards this, and our sponsor, uh, Crown Produce, and David Dubé have tried to make a contribution towards this, is to, is to have that weekly contact and to have that weekly dialogue. Um, I, I know that... Um, you were talking on Twitter about um, uh, why wasn't there more discussion about the Laval model uh, on the TSN broadcast. Well, that, that's an issue, uh, but if you have no context for the issue building up towards that game, you're not going to introduce that issue uh, in the midst of the game. TSN was there to show up and, and broadcast the game, and I can fully appreciate that. Uh, but if people are following the sport, on a regional and national basis uh, from week to week. And CIS is telling its story uh, out to the public on a regular basis and a consistent basis with, with destination programming uh, week to week. That's when that sort of discussion develops on a wider basis beyond the hard course. And uh, that's something that, that all parties that are sitting around the table right now have to make a commitment to and have to put a focus on if uh, CIS football is going to be in the conversation on a regular basis, not just a one-off bowl game or a one-off uh, uh, national event that pops up and then goes away for another 11 and a half months. And um, I agree with that. The uh, TSN did a good job of that. I like what the score does with the OUA, and they almost nationalize it, and that's where we get the outside uh, – the and the people outside of Ontario kind of jabbing at the OUA, saying that it's not as great, but they have the national broadcast. But it's nice to see those players get advertised. It's nice to see Kyle Quinlan's face out there. And from at least in a football sense in Canada, he is a household name. And maybe he, some fringe fans even know of him now. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think this is where the CFL is missing the boat because it was it was interesting to see the panel discussion with the two CIS coaches saying, yes, we want a Canadian quarterback. And then there's Mike Morielli putting a CFL PA hat on saying, well, he'll be a good quarterback regardless of nationality. And um, I know in my dealings with the with CFL.ca, one of the reasons uh, I'm not writing with them anymore is because I brought up the point of Canadian quarterbacks. And they said it wasn't in the uh, – in the interest of their stakeholders to discuss the Canadian quarterback situation. There are people within the CFL who are very resistant to creating a position uh, for Canadian quarterbacks. And you know what? If you want to uh, create um, a, uh, a better system within the, uh, the, the amateur ranks by, by, by having your best athlete play, uh, play quarterback, uh, rather than feel that he has to be compelled to move to a receiver or a linebacker or a running back position. Uh, if you want to have made in Canada uh, players that can eventually rise up and be stars in this country, uh, if you're the CFL, you have to make that commitment to putting Canadians first and Canadians in the top position on the field, and you need to develop Canadian quarterbacks the same way you would with a with a NCAA cut or an NFL cut, uh, Travis Lule wasn't made in a day. He was made over a number of years before he started in the CFL. Uh, we've seen countless number of NCAA quarterbacks who have been through the professional system uh, for a number of years before they come up here and sit on the bench for a number of years and don't even pan out. Um, the expectation that Kyle Quinlan could jump onto a CFL roster right away is being applied to him right away. And and so where is the logic in that? If these American quarterbacks come up into our system and need three years after they've had two or three years of of, of professional exposure, if they've been on a five- or six-year path 
to get to a point where they can even start a game? Why does Kyle Quinlan have have a pressure applied to him uh, if he comes in where he needs to start in his first or second year? Um, the CFL needs to buy time for these guys. They need to develop these guys. And if they truly say that this is our league, then we have to put our players first. Well, how are you supposed to build attention to the CIS if the best players are – if your greatest athletes aren't going to play that glamour position? Everyone knows, right, The C, in uh, especially in Canadian brand of football, your best player needs to be a quarterback. But if that quarterback has aspirations to go to play professional football, he can't do it. And Liam Mahoney for Concordia is – the first example that comes to mind where he switched to slot back because it gave him a better opportunity of going pro. So I, I just I agree with you on that. And even Eric Glavich with all of his athleticism, everyone would say, yeah, he'd be a nice CFL receiver. So I, yeah, I agree yeah. with that. And, it, and it's, hurting, it's hurting the way the game's being built. And if you want to have a successful domestic professional league, you need that successful domestic – feeder league as the NHL has the or the CJ uh, CHL which is very popular here you look at American football the NFL the NCAA it doesn't seem like the CIS and the CFL seem to be on the same page in terms of building or helping each other out build uh, interest yeah and, and I'd agree with you there and it's funny when I talk to people who work in the CFL who work in these front offices uh, the uh, people who seem warmest or even most bullish on putting uh, Canadian players first and up front, especially in the quarterback position, are Americans. And some of the ones who are uh, the most standoffish or downright condescending about it are Canadians. We have a way of beating up on ourselves in this country uh, that is uh, that is unlike most places on earth. Um, you know, uh, so if uh, uh, American trained coaches and American trained GMs are telling us that that yes, there is a path and there is a possible way here uh, to to develop quarterbacks with the incentive of developing on a professional roster, and that yes, there is uh, a, a a potential benefit by having the uh, most talented athlete on the field being your quarterback, making all the other players better because of his abilities uh, through through amateur football down the various levels, then I always find it a bit of a head-scratcher why, why Canadians are willing to sell uh, people from their own country short in the CFL. Well, agreed. It seems like there's uh, the anti-Canadian uh, arrogance, which is just, uh, I don't get it. I, I, it would be nice to see some of these quarterbacks get an opportunity. It would have been nice to see Glavik at least get a, a, a shot. I know his his mechanics might be a little unorthodox or whatnot, but it's nice seeing Sinopoli getting a look. And it'd be really nice to see Quinlan get a look. As, uh, as Neat Seeger brought up last time when we were all having that discussion, he <laughs> Quinlan had a legitimate shot to be a three-time Heck Creighton Award winner if last year's incident didn't happen and if people paid more attention the year before. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you there. Well, thanks a lot for joining us, Jim, and this will be the roundup for Rouge Radio, the CIS uh, version of it. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you a lot for coming in, Jim, and uh, filling us in on what's happening right now with the CIS going forward. Yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Hey, you. Yeah, you with that sandpaper and paintbrush getting ready to sand and paint that wooden fence again this year. When you could be sitting back, relaxing on your patio, and watching your neighbors do that work. Get rid of that wood fence and easily install a new low-maintenance resin fence that lasts. Visit Keter.com, K-E-T-E-R.com, for videos, product information, and more. You can find this fence at some Costco's across North America and always at Costco.ca with shipping right to your door. Keter.com. It's time for RougeRadio.com's final Canadian Junior Football League report of the season. I'm Josh Aldridge, and joined once again by John DiNapoli. And, John, what a way to go out. That was a terrific Canadian Bowl in Langley and looked for the longest longest time like we might have a major upset on our hands. But the Saskatoon Hilltops managed to pull out the 23-21 win for their third straight national championship and record 16th overall. Yeah, Josh, yeah, we couldn't ask for anything more in a Canadian final and 
some of us thought it was going to be a, a one-sided affair, and uh, I'm glad for the people in attendance and the people that watched it on, uh, on TV and on the Internet that uh, they were uh, treated to a, a well-played game, uh, 23-21, the final score for the Saskatoon Hilltops. And um, It started out uh, very slow for both teams after the scoreless first quarter. Uh, the Langley Rams uh, broke the tie just a uh, buck 36 into the second quarter as uh, quarterback Greg Bocott uh, hooked up with Malcolm Williams on a 16-yard touchdown strike. Uh, however, the Hilltops would come right back on their next drive and they finished it off with a Zach Schmidt uh, 18-yard field goal and it cut the lead to 7-3. Uh, about eight minutes later, Schmidt again would take a field goal, this time from 32 yards out, and uh, the defending champs were within one and um, looked like the game might have been slipping away from uh, the Rams at this point. Uh, but just before the half, uh, Bocott uh, would connect with uh, Michael Patko for a 73-yard catch and run uh, for a touchdown, and uh, the lengthy receiver broke a couple of tackles on the way into the end zone uh, with 2.18 to go in the quarter. And uh, There we are at the half in, in Langley, and it's uh, the Rams leading the Hilltops uh, 14-6. And I know you were a little shocked, and I was a little shocked uh, uh, seeing 14-6 at the half, but uh, give the Rams credit for... Uh, taking the lead and, and, and taking the game to the Hilltops, not uh, allowing them to establish the run and, and uh, keeping the quarterback, um, Matt Karpinka, on his, uh, on his toes for much of the first half. Uh, four minutes into the third quarter, however, uh, the Rams running back, Daniel Xavier, would uh, punch in another one and extended the lead to 21-6, and uh crowd's going wild, and it thinks like they might be able to, uh, to ride out a victory here. Uh, however, Nick Downey on the next uh, Rams possession uh, fumbled and completely changed the momentum of this game as Michael Waldron uh, recovered the fumble and uh, returned to the five-yard line, uh, setting up an Andre Lawan uh, five-yard uh, touchdown run on the next play, and it cut the lead to 21-13, uh, where it stood after three quarters. Um, then we get into the fourth quarter, and Zach Schmidt uh, connects on his third field goal of the game from 30 yards out, and uh, it's 21-16 at this point. And you could just see the uh, momentum has been drained out of the Rams, and um, the game is now the momentum uh, totally shifted over to uh, the Hilltops, and um, they didn't let the inexperience or, of the big game or anything get to them, and uh, they were able to complete the quarter comeback when uh, Matt Karpinka found uh, Graham Unruh for a 40-yard catch and run, and uh, was the Hilltops' first lead of the game, and, the, and they would not relinquish that uh, on their way to their third straight Canadian championship, uh, 23-21. Uh, the final score in Langley. Talked about this last week, heading into this game. Uh, the uh, the Rams would really have to play great defense to kind of keep this close. So it really seems kind of what what happened there. Just kind of kept the defending champs or the eventual champs just kind of at bay for a while. But just it seemed like it just kind of slipped away from there eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I look at the stats, and, and Graham Munro, you know, six catches for a game high, 218 yards in the touchdown, named offensive player of the game. Um, you know, other than that, you look at the offensive stats, and they were pretty much able to corral the offense. And, you know, you look at the stats, and they, they had 434 yards. It, you know, Saskatoon turns the ball over uh, four interceptions on the day. And I thought Langley played really good defense. I mean, they got gouged at times for yardage, but they didn't really give up a lot of points, and it kept them in the game. Uh, Andre Lawan, the big running back for for the Hilltoppers, you know, 23 carries for 112 yards, and that was a little over four yards a carry, uh, four and a half yards a carry. So, you know, they were able to keep him in check. You go look at the wide receivers, other than the six catches by by Grant, there was only uh, three other guys that caught balls. Uh, you know, John Trumpy had three for 47 yards, and, and again, they were kept in check as well. So, um, you know, four interceptions on the day, uh, one trick play, they got him 71 yards on a pass from uh, John Trumpy to, to Graham Unruh. And, you know, other than that, I thought uh, Langley had a great game plan, and they were just able, not able to capitalize on, on the four interceptions as best they could. Or the turn, turning point, like I said, was the fumble. And, um, good teams find a way to win, and uh, it's a great learning experience for Langley, Langley and hopefully, uh, they can come back and use that experience next year in the, in the Canadian Bowl final if they can make it that far. Absolutely. That, that experience is all important. Again, another thing we kind of talked about last week was that experience. They looked a little edgy uh, coming in. They, they weren't really all that sharp early on. Uh, Langley was neither offense was really all that sharp. I'm not sure what was going on with, uh, uh, with Saskatoon early on, but they eventually got it going. Both teams eventually got it going, but they just kind of seemed a little 
unnerved. And then when they got that took that big punch from uh, from from the hilltops with that turnover that turned into six points there in the in the third quarter. That 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 just really kind of set them back, and they didn't really seem to know how to respond to that. Again, a young, really young, talented team in Langley, and they should, they, they will learn from this, and they should move on, and they should be back in this kind of position uh, next year. Uh, what, what really struck you about this game? Well, we had previewed, and, and you had predicted uh, a Nick Downey touchdown somewhere along the line, and um, you know, looking at the stats of the game on, on special teams. I thought Saskatoon did a real good job of keeping Nick Downey in bay. He had four punt returns for 63 yards with a 26-yard long, and um, he had one kickoff return for 23 yards. And they did a great job of neutralizing uh, the return game of Nick Downey and that of Langley. And, um, you know, we don't give special teams as much credit as as we'd like at times, but uh, I got to give credit to the uh, to the Saskatoon kicking game and and their ability to cover the punts and and cover Nick Downey. We know he's the most explosive guy returning kicks in in Canadian junior football history, and uh, they did a real nice job bottling up on the day. And I, you know, it was a real great defensive effort by them on that way. And um, you know, defensive player of the game Dylan Kemp, uh, 11 solo tackles, setting a Canadian ball record. Uh, for 22 defensive points, so it was a it was a great team effort, and and we got to give the special teams the credit that it deserves a bottling up uh, a real superstar like Nick Downey on the day. And you mentioned that kicking game. Zach Schmidt had a pretty good game kicking the ball, uh, 290 yards on eight kicks, uh, 46 yard was as long, and then on field goals he hit he was three for three. None of them were overly long. The longest 32. But each one of those were critical. If he'd missed one of those, well, they're not winning their their third straight championship. And just his uh, kicking, his punting, keeping uh, uh, Downey off to the sidelines and bottling them up, so critical, so critical. And Downey was a little bit of a disappointment. I, I think we expected quite a bit more out of him in this game. And you mentioned earlier he had that big fumble that led to the uh, t- first touchdown for the Hilltops that got them going. So I think he'll bounce back. Heck of a talent. Uh, and he's got a few more years left in him in this league. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back. It was more than just the game on the weekend. Uh, there, there were awards handed out at the annual banquet beforehand. And uh, as they also unveiled their all-Canadian teams. We're going to start with the Gord Curry uh, Coach of the Year, and that goes to uh, John Vuvalaitis of the London Bee Feeders. Uh, they finished seven and one in Ontario Football Conference uh, Championships for the first time in their history. Uh, Rookie of the Year went to uh, running back Jordan Samol of the Edmonton Wildcats. Uh, the Peter Dalla Riva Outstanding Offensive Player, no no shock here in Jordan Yance of the Vancouver Island Raiders. The Larry Rock Outstanding Defensive Player of the Year. Um, I don't think it's much surprise here that Wilgan Darabal, the uh, Sam Leonard Cougars with uh, 19 tackles and 15 sacks on the year. Uh, the CJFL Past Commissioner's Award went to Ben White of the Okanagan Sun. CJFL Stuart McDonald Executive of the Year went to George Thompson of the London Bee Feeders. Uh, the CJFL Life Member Award uh, went to Blake Roberts of the Okanagan Sun. Now for the All-Canadian teams. Uh, on the offensive line, you have Nathan uh, Karanachi of the London Bee Feeders, Anthony Daly of the Langley Rams, uh, Frank Pellegrino of the Calgary Colts, Matt uh, Leung of the Saskatoon Hilltops, and Tyler Oldendorf of the Vancouver Island Raiders. At receiver, we have Anthony Pizzuti of the Hamilton Hurricanes, Whitman Tamuziak of the Vancouver, Vancouver Island Raiders, Kyle McGinnis of the Saskatoon Hilltops, and Brett Carter of the Winnipeg Rifles. At running back, we have Greg Morris of the West Shore Rebels and Jordan Samol of the Edmonton Wildcats. Uh, the quarter of Quarterback, of course, is Jordan Yance of the Vancouver Island Raiders. Uh, the punter is Quinn Van Gliswick of the West Shore Rebels. And, of course, the place kicker, uh, no surprise here, uh, Zach Medeiros of the London Bee Feeders. On defense, uh, defensive line, uh, CJFL Defensive Player of the Year, Wogan Darabo of the St. Leonard Cougars, uh, Evan Foster of the Langley Rams, uh, Donovan Dale of the Saskatoon Hilltops, uh, Stephen Doidge of the Okanagan Sun. At linebacker is Adam Grill from the Hamilton Hurricanes, uh, Adam Konar of the Langley Rams, and Stephen Baranowski of the Calgary Colts. Uh, defensive backs are Neil 
Riley Grant of the Brampton Bears, Tremaine Apperly of the Vancouver Island Raiders, Adam Lawrence of Adam Edmonton Wildcats, uh, Ian Berry of the London Beef Eaters, and Jermaine Gabriel of the Calgary Colts. Uh, your return specialty, of course, return specialist is uh, Nick Downey of the Langley Rams. So uh, it's a real impressive list. Uh, you can tell who uh, the teams that are well represented in the uh, in the Jostens Cup and uh, uh, the uh, BCFC uh, semifinals and the Canadian Bowl uh, well represented here on the uh, all Canadian first teams, uh, all Canadian. And very impressive list of players, and uh, that list is going to be losing a lot of guys, but there's still a lot of great talent coming back. So uh, looking forward to some great things from these uh, returning players next year. Absolutely. A- any kind of, uh, I guess, snubs or players that you thought, oh, geez, maybe he should have deserved an extra look there? Well, look, the one that really stands out, and being an A.K.O. Fratman, and, and I'm going to uh, – two A.K.O. Fratman guys that uh, kind of – get omitted from this because they kind of don't qualify because they weren't all conference players. But, uh, I think, uh, uh, our linebacker Mason B coast can play up right up with them with the uh, three guys that were there. Uh, I know that you got to have one from every, uh, conference there. Uh, but I, I know one that's kind of, if we were to play a three, four and it was the extra linebacker in a box, uh, I think Mason B coast would be a great call there. And, and punting wise, uh, Quinn Van Glitswick for West Shore Rebels with the All-Canadian punter. And I look at his numbers and I look at the AQO punter, uh, uh, Dan Colella, and, and his average was uh, probably six yards more per punt. But uh, uh, Zach Medeiros was both the place kicker and the punter in the OFC. So, you know, Dan doesn't qualify for All-Canadian. But, uh, you know, that one omission uh, kind of sticks with me, uh, knowing that uh, the punter with the AQO frab and was about uh, six more yards per average and, and punted uh, – uh, quickly, about 20 more times for the season. So uh, that one was a little shock, but uh, congratulations to Quinn, Quinn Van Glisswick on uh, being the All-Canadian punter. Kind of the one that really stands out to me that kind of got overlooked uh, on the All-Canadian team, uh, VI Raider, although they had a lot of uh, – they had four players overall on the two teams, uh, Dylan Chaptelain, uh their outstanding linebacker. Uh, he was an unanimous selection to the BCFC uh, all, all, or the All-BCFC team and uh, didn't get mentioned here at all in the all-Canadian list. A little bit surprising there. His his stats uh, uh, were, qu- were quite a bit better than Adam Kohenar, who also ended up as the BCFC defensive player there. Still an outstanding player, but a little bit surprising to see uh, to, to see no mention of uh, Shaft Delane there. Uh, now, the other kind of big buzzword this weekend, uh, there's a bit of discussion uh, about expansion. Now, do you think the the uh, CGFL is something that or is ready to expand? Do you think the the game is ready to see more CGFL teams across the country? Or there's pockets where you see where the game is really kind of set to explode, or that there should be more representation there? Well, you hit it there with the latter statement about pockets of uh, parts of Canada that uh, can uh, withstand uh, expansion. I think in the OFC, our, you know, the five-year plan as of June 2011 was to expand to 12 teams uh, in the next five years. And uh, at this particular moment, uh, there's, you know, some feelers out from some towns in, in, in Ontario. But the problem is in Ontario is, is like we said last week, the financial uh, aspect of the game just isn't there yet. So when you're expanding into markets that maybe financially can't withstand a junior football team, because it really is, is a big time expense, and you got to be able to have a budget of you know about a hundred thousand to to really compete on nationally, and uh, that's one of the problems we have in Ontario. You get into the B, uh, the PFC, um, and you got six teams, so you, you're trying to find two to make it an even eight. And uh, you know, Fort McMurray's name is brought out quite a bit uh, about uh, you know they're looking to expand into that into that market. And, I mean, if they could find another one, whether it's in, in Manitoba or you know, Saskatchewan, somewhere along the lines, but they already got two teams. So um, I think expanding in, in pockets of Canada, I, I'd like to really see the league go east more than anything outside of, uh, you know, Quebec East. We've got Montreal with St. Leonard Cougars, but uh, I'd love to see the CGFL expand to possibly an Atlantic League uh, to get into our umbrella with the CGFL and, and really make it a coast-to-coast league instead of, you know, central on, you know, central of Canada from Ontario West, you know, how do you prove it's a Canadian championship when half the country, pretty much, you know, a third of the country isn't playing in the Canadian Junior Football League. So I'd really like to see the league expand east uh, and then the pockets of Alberta that could probably withstand a team uh, 
and, and expand this league even more. I remember the days when it was 27, 28 teams in the Canadian Football League, and I, I'd really like to see it get back up there. And it's a great alternative. We, we've uh, heard for years and years how the game's exploding in places like Quebec, but it comes down to is, is there enough money and desire to build CFL stadiums in places like Quebec City or in the Maritimes this is a great alternative to that. The, a lot of the infrastructure is already in place for uh, for CJFL franchises, but it's a matter of just kind of getting that word out there a little bit more, I think. I agree totally. Out in Halifax and St. John's and, and, out, in the, and out East, I mean, they host a couple of CFL games the last couple of years, and it's proven that they have the stadiums and the infrastructure there to, you know, withstand a, you know, a football program like that. Whether the community wants to sit there and back, you know, 18 to 22 year olds uh, for football like they do for hockey out there, uh, it would it'd be light, nice to see. I really would. Uh, one of the competing factors in the, in the province of Quebec is, is CJEP there, which is kind of just a, I don't want to say a continuation of high school, but it kind of takes into consideration the grade 12, 13, first year out of, you know, high school league, which is supposed to be what pretty much the CJFL is supposed to be. But they have their CJEP league where, you know, a lot of great talent comes out of that league, and, and they use that as a stepping stone to get their NCA scholarships and stuff. And uh, I know a lot of players that have played at Michigan over the years, uh, the Kashama brothers and stuff, and Shimonga Biaka Batuka that played the NFL that were uh, uh, CJEP players out of View Montreal. I'd really love to see them play in the CJFL before going, you know, to the NCA, but uh, that's their choice. And I'd really like to see the Quebec really get a league back the way they had uh, back in the 80s and uh, early 90s when, the, you know, the Quebec, province had their own uh, version of Canadian junior football. You mentioned it used to be at 27 teams across the country. Do you see the CJFL coming back to that? Do you see the, the sport growing? I don't, you know, that's a tough one, Josh. You know, I don't see how you can possibly get more teams in, in the markets we have already. You know, there's a lot of teams in Ontario that are fledging right now because of financial. So it's not about, you know, right now in Ontario, it's not about expansion or Canadian football expanding. I think we got to just I'll strengthen, especially in Ontario, the teams that we have. And if we can get the infrastructure in place uh, locally uh, and make these teams stronger financially, uh, then you can start to expand and, and, and make each you know league better. Unfortunately, the money ain't there in Ontario right now, and you can't find the corporate backing to you know support these great teams. And it's unfortunate, but uh, we go with what we got. And I, I'd really like to see the league get up to 30 teams. I think there's enough cities in this to, in this great country of ours that play football that we should have 30 plus teams uh playing junior football uh there's 20 teams in the in the ontario hockey league and you know 20 more you know you got the quebec league and you got the western league there's enough if we can support you know 60 plus junior hockey teams why can't we support 30 uh junior football teams in this country and, and i really like to see the uh you know the, the backing of, of the population of canada get behind football as much as they do the hockey because we really do play some great football you know bigger fields uh bigger ball you know, a tougher game to play than, than the American style at times. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's something that this this Canadian Junior Football League would nearly needs to uh, assess whether, you know, expansion might, is the right way to go. And if it is the right way to go, make sure we find the markets that uh, can sustain, uh, you know, financially a big uh, uh, product of the CGFL. Any last thoughts for the year Ed, before we head off into into the sunset, I guess, into the into the off season, into the winter? Uh, and any final thoughts on the year, uh, and kind of looking forward to next year? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, starting out west, uh, everybody thought Vancouver Island was going to come out of the BCFC, and, and they were upset in the semifinals by a great Langley team, a great great host of the Canadian Bowl this past weekend, and uh, a little shock. Great, great for the BCFC that you know other teams are able to step up and win games. Uh, in, the, in the Prairie Football Conference, Calgary was ranked number one all year long and gets upset in the playoffs by Regina Thunders. Uh, so there was a, they were able to, you know, expand and, and, you know, when you get right down to it, you still got the big, big uh, Hilltops winning the nat- third straight national title, which, um, you know, shows their dominance over, you know, the last couple of years in 16 national titles. So it's good for that. In the Ontario Football Conference, you got the London Bee Feeders winning their first title ever. Uh, since their inception in 1975, so it's good for Ontario that it's not just always you know the Hamiltons, the Akeel Fratman, and, and and the St. Leonard Cougars winning all the time. So uh, it was great balance in the OFC this year. It was great balance in in, in the Prairie Football Conference after the Calgary Colts were eight and zero and stuff. So it, it's great. It, it looks 
you know, the product on the field is outstanding, and, and it's only going to get better. These kids are going to get bigger, stronger, and faster in the off season. And, and I look for a lot of great things next year uh, out of the players returning, and, and there's a lot of them returning. You know, uh, a lot of great players that are, you know, uh, their time has come to an end, and they're going to be missed. Uh, a couple here in Windsor, um, so a couple of West that really stand out, like Jordan Yant's career and the Canadian Junior Football League has, has come to an end. And, uh, you know, he's set a lot of records, and we tip our cap to him for, for an outstanding performance. And it's one of those things that uh, it's sad to see him go into, into the sunset for his Canadian Junior Football career, but it's, it, it's five years is up. And uh, it's been a treat to watch a lot of great football this year. It's been a, great to uh, be able to talk with you every week on this. And uh, uh, thank you to Rouge Radio for uh, giving me this opportunity this year to do, uh, to be able to speak my mind on Canadian Junior Football and, and recap what's happened in the, in the, in the CJFL. Uh, it's been great working with you, John. I couldn't put it much better myself about the season and what lays ahead for next year. I think there's a lot that's going to be turned over next year. There's going to be a lot of changes next year. It should be pretty exciting. And that will wrap up the final CJFL report of the season on RougeRadio.com. For John DiNapoli, I'm Josh Aldridge. Have a great winter, everybody.